I know you. You're not a traitor. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to Boundary Break, the show where we basically take a camera anywhere we want to try and find secrets and discoveries in some of our favorite games. I'm your co-host Snipey, and today we're taking a look at Call of Duty Black Ops, which I believe is actually the first time that we've covered Call of Duty on this channel. But before we get into the video proper, I have a special message from our sponsor, Empires and Puzzles. Empires and Puzzles is an award-winning free-to-play match 3 puzzle RPG game, being one of the first of its kind to combine the two game styles. Easy to pick up, but hard to master, Empires and Puzzles has you simply match shields of the same color to attack. The more you match, the stronger the attacks, but make sure to use your specials at the right moment. The game follows the story of a kingdom in need of saving from the enemies of the realm. Travel to faraway lands such as mystical seas of Atlantis, face the realm of the gods in Valhalla, and even to the tombs of ancient Egypt. You can collect over 400 collectible heroes available based around different elements, and every month unique new heroes are introduced. Train your heroes and build up their talent tree to upgrade and power up your team. After after you've won, use your spoils to grow up your empire by leveling up food and iron production, craft useful battle items, and train your troops or even summon more heroes. You can even join an alliance and raid other alliances in PvP or by going toe-to-toe -to -toe with other players in head-to-head -head battles for rewards. Why journey alone when you can share the fun with your friends? And if you invite your friends to join the game, they can team up with you for new challenges. You'll even be rewarded when their account reaches level 10. So don't miss out on the opportunity to play with your pals and reap the rewards together. And of course, there's also the beach party event. So make sure to break out the water balloons and the beach chairs because this summer event is going to be hot. It'll be going live in the game from June 12th to July 16th. So dive into the event with 10 all new heroes with a summer theme, exclusive event stages, and even some special power-ups. Thanks again to Empires and Puzzles for sponsoring the video, and be sure to check out the game on Android and iOS. And starting off in a little bit of a weird place, I wanted to look at Dead Ops Arcade. And for the most part, we see this map from the top down, each area taking up its own screen. But if we pull the camera back, all these maps are actually loaded into the same level and just laid out in a grid that we can fly across. And you can see how condensed these maps are. They're also not laid out in a specific order with no real flow between the maps because it jumps around so often. In fact, some of the later stages you go to are right next to the start. When you change between screens, you have a black screen that pops up and then fades away and then you're there. Well, if you're teleporting off to another area, what happens is your character is just teleported and the camera follows you. And if we slow it down, you can see the tweening between the two spots. But as you know, as you progress through the stages, they go through their own little day-night cycle and you'll see the room from different angles. Well, what happens is the camera will very quickly rotate into a new position before that occurs. And Dead Ops Arcade also gives us our first look at a dev cube, except this one's less cubey more boxy, and is stored inside this wall. There's also zombie models that we never see in any of the other games that are specifically in Dead Ops Arcade, like this mechanic zombie, and this tall Russian zombie, as well as these little ghillie suit zombies with no faces. Moving on, I wanted to take a look at some of the normal zombies maps. So first up, we have Nocturne and Toten, which being the first zombies map doesn't really have a whole lot going on, but we can get a full zoom out of this entire area. There's really not that much outside, and as you can see, the entire map is pretty much encased with fog, as well as the 2D trees wrapping around the outside. The moon in the sky is also just a flat image. Next up is Kinoder Toten which takes place inside of a theater. And while you go outside into a little alleyway, you don't ever really get a good look at what's going on outside of this theater. And in reality, there's only about a block that we end up getting to see, and that's outside of the front door. There's this wall with a lookout tower on it, as well as some cars, and some pretty simple buildings with nothing inside them. There's also an antenna really far off into the distance. And to give the appearance of light shining into this building, there are boxes outside of specific holes in the ceiling, as well as windows, that basically just up the exposure and make the outside look brighter, which we can see here. Also, whenever you go through the teleporter, your camera for just a brief second is put into this black box with the teleporter animation playing inside of it, with there being one for each possible player. And here's what Kino der Toten looks like from the sky.
Next up we have 5, which reuses the Pentagon location from the campaign, one of my favorite details being these filing cabinets that say Top Secret, Medium Secret, and Low Secret, which are not actual clearances. There's also plenty of rooms with interiors that you're not really able to see anyway, and lots of extraneous detail that, while not too interesting to look at directly, allow them to make the space feel lived in and large. Some rooms will have specific themes, like a break room with items that you'd find in a break room, and some rooms are just more empty, like this one with a lamp in it, and that's it. There's also this desk with a poorly cropped picture of Nixon on it. And one of the things that I find most interesting with this map in general is how connected and thoroughly thought through this building feels. The stairways seem to connect into hallways, which seem to connect into the actual maps, even if most of those areas don't end up being rendered. You also have the elevators that connect all the floors, and these elevators are rendered with full shafts, even if those really aren't visible at any point. And the elevators do move between the actual floors. And I do want to mention two specific Perca Cola machines, that being Juggernog and Speed Cola, because Speed Cola seems to have part of the Juggernog texture on the inside of its machine where the drinks would be. And also, for some reason, the Juggernog machine has wheels on it, when none of the other Perk machines do. Getting a good look at these maps is also a little difficult because this game uses such aggressive culling, and we can see that particularly looking at Moon, and trying to get a look at the interior spaces from an outside angle, with stuff unloading pretty much the moment that you take the camera into the wall. Also, I couldn't trigger the easter egg in time for this video, but I can at least show you where the rockets for the easter egg are stored before they fly off into the Earth, Here's also a full view of the moon map, where you can see the excavators, all the craters, and the different level of detailed sections for different areas of the map, with a lot of the finer detail being areas where you'd be able to visit, like the dome as well as all of the station itself. Also, the craters are just their own separate objects, often merged within the floor or with each other. They're not actually part of the ground itself. And this entire map is pretty much all contained in just this one huge square. Also, the beginning section of the map where you're on Earth and take the teleport of the moon happens in just a small little section of map which is right next to the actual moon map itself, just using different lighting. And if you were to manage to get there without taking the teleporter back, you will keep your moon gravity. So since this game is a first person shooter, oftentimes your character model doesn't really exist outside of having arms. And for this free cam, we're not actually able to see that first person view model, except for one specific turret sequence in the mission Rebirth. Every now and again, we do get a body, but those are during scripted and cinematic sequences. These full body models are used whenever you go into a cutscene or a small little cinematic thing like carrying a body or zip lining. But one specific detail that I thought was really interesting is that Reznov's model is missing his right index finger, which is accurate to his character. But it's a detail that you wouldn't be able to notice at any point during gameplay. Mason's full body models are also always accompanied by a hook that just floats behind his back, tethered to a short rope. We also have those interrogation sequences where Mason is tied down to a chair. Now, you experience these scenes both from a third person and a first person perspective, and sometimes both at once, where you'll be sitting in the chair in first person, but seeing Mason on the screen with another camera. Now, the way this is handled is that Mason in the chair with his face visible is actually stored underneath the actual interrogation room in its own empty box with harsher lighting. This Mason is used whenever you can actually see his full body as well as his face. And just like in other first-person shooters, whenever there is a cutscene and you have that full body, what happens outside of your camera view isn't really all that important, and so a lot less focus is paid towards animating those aspects realistically. Oftentimes, this manifests in not having the arms line up to where you would think that they'd need to be, or having body parts phase into each other. And in most other games, it's a pretty good bet to assume that if the legs are off-screen and you can't move your camera down, they're probably not being animated for whatever sequence you're watching. Except in this game, for the most part, whatever character you're playing, as has their legs animated even if they're not visible by the camera. And while some, I would imagine, are just mocap information, I don't think this is the case for all of them. It's 
scripted NPCs are also treated in a little bit of a similar way, where they're really only important once they're on screen. And so for instances like the soldier who hands you a radio, he's not animated at all, and is frozen in place until you get closer. And for NPCs that have a scripted sequence once you enter a room, they're usually placed in that room beforehand, just idling inside the room, like Reznov in The Defector, or that Castro body double and the lady, who, while still being unarmed, is standing in the idle pose for if she had a gun. So for this next section, I'm going to tackle my favorite parts of the campaign that I found in a little bit of a linear order. And in the first mission, there's actually a couple things. That car you escape in is loaded into the map already, except it's in a different position and teleports into place right before you round the corner. There's also these two NPCs stored out of bounds for seemingly no reason, and if you do shoot them, it ends the mission, so they do count as civilians. Also, for this part where the line of police officers are shooting at you, the gunfire, for the most part, is not coming from the policemen, and is instead coming from the air in front of them. Them. And if I put the camera in between the gunfire and the policeman, the bullets are actually able to hit them. For the next part of the mission, there's these planes that fly overhead, and they don't have their propellers spinning, and so they just float across the sky. In this courtyard, there's also a plane stored underneath the ground, made up of perpendicular 2D images to create a 3D object. And for the level of Orkuta, there's a sequence where a ton of prisoners are running in this open area, but way more than the game would feasibly be able to handle. And so the trick they use to get the crowd this big is that they've turned some 3D models into 2D sprites that cycle through a basic running animation and always face the camera. But there are also low-poly models mixed in with the crowd here. These ones are able to be shot or exploded or interacted with in some capacity. They're used throughout the level as well. There's also a section where you're pushing a minecart and getting shot at by a turret, and this turret is actually a modern weapon. Now, the mission where you go to the Pentagon, it's basically one glorified cutscene, and so you don't get to explore a whole lot of this area. But for each area you visit, like the helipad at the start, as well as the highway, and the Pentagon itself, are detailed environments. And the map for this mission is actually pretty huge, using water and 2D images of landmarks to create a vast area off into the distance. Just outside the Pentagon, we have a parking lot full of low-poly cars, made up of simple geometry as well as a simple metallic texture. They've also got square wheels. Let me know if you drive one of these. The interior of the Pentagon is also pretty much the same as in the Zombies Map 5, though to fill out these crowds of people there's a lot of duplicate models cycling through animations, and since this area has the camera pan around a lot, the extra geometry of this map now begins to make more sense. There are also elements reused throughout the map to give it more detail, like this picture of Sergeant Roebuck, a character from Treyarch's previous Call of Duty game, as well as this slideshow of screenshots from the game. And here's an example of characters freezing once they walk out of frame for a cutscene. The cutscene where you point a gun at JFK, which looks like this from another angle. Every time you start a mission, there is a white screen that slowly fades out after doing a little animation showing you the details of that mission. So for the background characters where they're already doing looping animations, not much really changes. But for the main cast, pretty much all of them will be standing around until the moment which they're needed and then they teleport into place for their specific animation or position. And for some missions, like the start of USDD, characters are stored in overlapping positions in their default pose. For the mission SOG, we have a plane crash, which we can view from multiple different angles. The plane actually goes quite a bit of distance before it stops animating. The runway itself also doesn't really go far in that direction anyway, pretty much ending right outside the player's view once they turn onto it. And as you can see, some plane parts fall through the floor right after passing the player car. But as the animation progresses, we can see that they're all still attached to the plane itself. We also have another sequence where a lot of models are running in place at once. Though for this specific sequence, all of the models are just low-poly models that are spawned in, moved to a point, and then despawned. But they spawn in and run in the exact same way every time. And it's really hard to see, but there is a drone that appears to fly overhead at some point, and this drone is just a really low opacity object that flies across the sky. And it appears as though, even if characters are unarmed, they need to have a weapon somewhere around them. We can see this with a tank gunner as well, where he has a pistol stored inside the tank somewhere underneath his feet. It's still attached to his model, moves with it, and also shoots occasionally.
Now it's time to look at some viewer requests. And if you want to leave your requests for upcoming episodes while we're working on them, feel free to follow She Says' his Twitter, where you'll be able to receive updates as well as leave your requests. And for the first viewer request, you guys wanted to know if the Thunder Gun in the wall is still there, even if you don't do the Easter Egg. And unfortunately, the answer is no. Once you do the Easter Egg, it spawns in and phases through the wall but it is not visible beforehand. And for the second viewer request, you guys really wanted me to take a look at the mission Revelations, where Mason walks around the area that he was interrogated in, and a whole bunch of trippy sequences happen. Every sequence that happens in this level is all in this one level, with the different sections and different set pieces all being set somewhere in the stage, usually in their own separated area, like the one with Mason on the table, or the Rizalka, with both being enclosed in boxes to avoid any any interference from the rest of the level. The Rizalka is also mostly only rendered on one side, and the only thing else in that area is just the rest of the dock, as well as a crane and some crates. And the room with Mason on the table is surprisingly huge, and if we move the camera around, you can see the scale of it, comprised of multiple floors as well as details that you can't really see at any point during this sequence. And where Hudson punches you in the face, just underneath the floor, there is a black box, which I believe is used for the effect where your screen gets really long. And of course, we have the rocket. The same rocket is in the mission executive order and is the centerpiece of the level. And at one point, you do blow it up. But before we blow it up, if we take the camera inside, there is a dev cube located inside the rocket. And I'm not really 100% sure what textures are wrapped around it, but it's very brightly colored and has some shapes on it. But that's not the only thing inside the rocket because we also have the debris that you will end up seeing later after you've blown it up. And specifically, this chunk here. There's a sequence in the game where you pilot a blackbird, where you go from the ground up into the atmosphere and then guide your allies through a little bit of level. Well, you probably didn't think much of it going through it yourself. It's actually a lot more complicated than you would think. So the scene starts in first person as you walk to and board this Blackbird. And because you see it at multiple angles, this entire runway is a section of the map. Since you're viewing this from first person as well, a whole bunch of stuff happens on the outside of your perspective, like models deloading, as well as this guy standing off the ground so you can see him from the window. Once you're up into the sky, you transfer into the back seat, where your model has now been replaced with just floating arms. But what you might not have realized is that the shot of the Blackbird up in the atmosphere is happening not too far away from that airfield, and the view you get of the Earth below is just an image wrapped around in 3D space. And the view you get from this console is actually from a third section of this map, seen by a separate camera. And through this monitor, you see it through a filtered lens. But if we take the camera down to this map, we can see that there's a lot of alterations made to make it appear on the console as it does. Like having the characters glow. That's not a filter. The characters are just glowing. The floor is also less saturated compared to the objects above it, like the trees and rundown cars, to give more contrast. You may have also noticed that the cars are colored reddish pink, and this gives it an almost inverted coloration on the console. And since this camera sees from the top down, and you're able to see inside of buildings, the walls of these buildings are just a really, really low opacity, with their ceilings being almost invisible. There's also this section of the game where you hide in the snow as a group of enemies walk past you. And there's a couple of interesting things that happen here. Namely, you're not really hiding all that well, and the group that walks by your teammates actually walks into one of them and moves them. They also disappear right after walking by you. And something a little interesting is that even though you're not able to see the bottom half of your body during this scene, your entire body is still shown. During the mission Project Nova, there are these cutscenes where Reznov talks by a fire, in a nondescript room somewhere in Vorkuta. Taking the camera back a little bit, we can see more of this hallway, and it's pretty sparse. The fire that Reznov is talking by is just floating there, it's not in anything, it's not in like a barrel or anything like that. And the hallway continues down for another like 30 feet. It's not fully enclosed either with openings on the left and right, and the back wall behind the camera is not visible within the scene. And this hallway is enclosed in a box, and if we pull the camera even further back, we can see 
see that this room takes place in the center of the entire map, with every other section of the level radiating around it. And yeah, for each part of the level, there's its own unique set of map geometry, including multiple different sets of geometry for the ship in particular, with different amounts of the map visible, as well as different layouts for the ship. These are usually swapped between cutscenes, except in one instance where you ride a rope down to the ice below, and the moment you hit the ground, it swaps to a different ship. During the mission rebirth, you're loaded into the level, basically in a crate. And if we take the camera outside of this crate, there's nothing on the outside. You're just a crate floating through the air, not attached to anything, until you're lowered into place, and the mission begins proper. And one of my favorite parts about this level, more than honestly anything else, is that all of the boats in this area are the same boat, and just reused multiple times. As for the final mission of the game, again, everything takes place in one map, with the different set pieces laid out so that you can just be moved towards them and they happen. This includes the final scene of the game, where you swim up to the surface of the water as the Rizalka sinks to the ground below you, with all the boats you swim up towards already being stored in the map. And to wrap up the video, I wanted to do a quick recap of some of the miscellaneous stuff that I thought was pretty cool, but I couldn't really fit it anywhere else. Like this low-poly bird. The front of this helicopter is the only thing that's highly detailed, with the rest of the back being smoothed over, as well as extremely reflective. On the elements sticking off the main model, like the wings, you can also see the textures being wrapped around incorrectly. By the way, if you think that this low-poly helicopter gets reused again later in the game, you'd be wrong. That helicopter that you fly towards the Rizalka is actually a fully detailed helicopter. Anyway, here's an actual low-poly bird. So sometimes enemies will spawn at a higher elevation and shoot at the player from a window or a balcony or something of the sort. Taking the camera up to where those enemies are reveals that there's no floor. This technique is actually used a couple times throughout the game, usually just to create a fake interior, where there will be walls and a ceiling, but no floor, since you would be unable to see the floor during normal gameplay. Also, the game scripting is really easy to break, and if I move into the free cam while a scripted sequence is happening, usually I can break one of the triggers that would cause something to happen, usually at the end of levels to signify the level has ended, or to swap loading zones. And so characters will continue to act as though they were still in the game, or for vehicles specifically, they'll just stop at a stopping point and won't move anymore. Also, Weaver, who very explicitly has his eye stabbed out in the game itself and wears an eye patch for the rest of the game, still has his eye on his model. Of course, it's covered by the eye patch, but it is still there. Okay, so that is about it for Black Ops, other than the final credit sequence. It, it takes place in an empty box. Well, not quite so empty. It does have its little rectangle. This box has gridded textures with some numbers on them. Not entirely sure what these numbers mean, but that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I hope that whatever day you watch this was a pleasant one, a great one, whichever is better to you. I have been Snipey, your Boundary Break co-host, and I will catch you guys later. See ya.